years ago when I was in the military and uh, I hate to admit it because it was so long ago now and when I went to shooting schools a lot of times what was primarily taught was uh, weapon hand reaction hand shooting and of course speed reloads that go on with that what was generally not taught uh, and if it was it was on a very minor scale only standing was uh, malfunctions with one hand and a lot of the time what was noted was hey if something happens like a malfunction and you're down to one hand then leave the scene but nobody ever talks about well what if you're shot in a pelvic girdle what if you can't leave the scene what if you're under such gunfire that you can't make it to that next uh, piece of cover and concealment what if you have to stay right there and fight it out what if you were paying at the paying at the counter checking out and immediately uh, you just took a hit like your situational awareness was, hey, I'm swiping my credit card and now my gunfight starts on the ground and I can't get up. Now I'm going through the speed reload, but what happens if I have a malfunction? Are we to tell that person, hey, sorry, good luck, right? We are trying to work through a series of problems. Life's not gonna go the way we want it to go, but we do know that if we put in information to our hard drive, then we will reference that information when we uh, are in a, an encounter. So an example of that would be how to start a fire. Well, I could read a book, and then in the event that I need to start a fire, I'll at least have something in regards to reference material that'll help me along. It'll probably take a little bit longer than normal, but I'll still be able to get it done. I'd so want to kill that bird right now. I don't know where he's at, or he'd be dead, or she. I don't really care at this point. But nevertheless, the next way uh, would be if you walked like uh, Les Stroud and Survivor Man. That would be another good way in which to um, learn how to start a fire. You could see, I'm a better in visual so I could see what he's doing and then understand it as he's explaining it a little bit better. The third way is I could have a person in front of me which I get to ask questions with. I get to interact and I really get to see it live, smell it, feel it, whatever the case is and watch it happening right here and I guarantee I'll be able to start a fire a lot faster based on that than the other two methods that I told you. But the best way to start a fire is how? It's for you to do it. It's for you to learn how to do it. Now, when we talk about a fire, typically then we have time. In this case, we don't have time. So we need to do these things. We need to ingrain these things so that if in the event that we're in a situation where tenths of a second matter, we have a response. So the next malfunction we're gonna go over is stovepipe. Now, the great thing about at least a vertical stovepipe is that we pretty much treat it like we did yesterday uh, when we worked through um, slide out of battery. We have kind of two points now that we can hook on. One is the rear sight, um, the other is the shell casing. And of course, a lot of these drills, anytime you have a red dot, uh, whether it's a hollow sun or an RMR or some type of aim point, it's much easier for you to be able to start leveraging that on the ground uh, and anywhere else. Now, remember, we're going on worst case scenario, which is, hey, something's happened to me and I'm stuck now in the supine, urban prone, prone position where I decide to get in those positions. But we also know that we can use things around us. So if I'm a shootout in a parking lot, I've got hood, bumper, tire, wheel well. I have a lot of different things that I can start working and cycling that gun off of that doesn't involve my my body at all. And in the event that I, I screw up and I make a mistake, I mean, I am already shot at this point, so who knows? We could be slowly but surely starting to bleed out and I still have to finish the fight no matter what. So when we can, we try to always use our environment with us. So we're gonna start going through stovepipe. So this is our typical stovepipe that we're used to, vertical one, and I can leverage off the shell casing right here, or I can leverage off the rear sight. One of the things to remember is that if I'm strong side, real easy. If I'm in that three, four o'clock position, as long as we're dealing with our weapon hand, then it's a lot easier. And then of course, appendix carry, everything's in front of me. Now I don't need to worry about, um, like I did on a speed reload negotiating shirt, I'll just go through the shirt to cycle and get that casing out of there. Uh, when we're dealing with our uh, uh, reaction hand, same thing that we'll work on is going off the magazine, the holster, the belt, any of those hard points. So when we're on the reaction hand, again, I have what's in front of me coming 
off and cycling. And then one of the other things to consider is that if I am in a three or four o'clock position, what's probably going to happen at that point is we're gonna start getting down to footwear and getting that uh, round out of there because we're not gonna be able to make it back to our holsters. But if you're carrying a spare mag on you, this is where we would utilize that spare mag. As long as I know where my hard points are, I'm good. Couple of the other things, I really like a good, strong and durable belt because yes, I can use the buckle, but depending upon um, the stitch in and the way the belt is designed, that Kodora right there hooked on the belt line right here, out and away, really is very, very rigid. So <clears throat> not only do you want a good holster in this case, but you definitely want a good belt as well. As far as appendix carrying goes, all you're going to see me do is this, so I don't need to waste our time. Let's go as if we're back in a three, four o'clock position or strong side. <clears throat> if I don't have a spare bag on my side, then I'm going to high hip it, catch the belt. The next step we're gonna go into is, uh, I'm gonna look at straight prone, and then we're gonna also look at uh, urban. We know that we have spring pressure pulling the slide forward. So if I can get the slide to lock back to the rear, I could treat this like a double feed, which I'll show you later, so I don't wanna waste our time doing it right now. But when we're in this position, one of the hardest things is gonna be with your reaction hand, and that's just trying to get into the position where we can roll and one of the things that I like to do, instead of just trying to scoop it out in front of you, put it in real close to you. Then take your body weight and drop it in close to the gun. And what it'll also do is it'll help pin your arm down. Because a lot of times when we're like this, we slip with it. We can't get the traction that we want. And remember, what we're talking about again is pinning the slide, moving the frame. So to help facilitate that, I put the body weight on it, up and out and then I'm bringing the gun right back up. So kind of a little trick so that the gun doesn't slide. Remember, we're moving the frame and leaving the slide in position, cl clearing that particular malfunction. When we're sideways and urban prone, it, to me, it's real easy because I'm bringing the arm in and I'm already leveraging body weight on top. So whether you're, um, right side urban prone with this in your weapon hand or you are left side urban prone with this in your left hand that's really not going to be the issue what's going to be the issue is when you're right side urban prone and this is the hand that you now have to use and that's what we're going to talk about next these are the sides you're definitely going to have to get creative sometimes you can get this thing dug into the ground extending the arm out in front of you so i'm all the way here at a full extension and then i dig the rear sight in up and out is always very, very important. We're trying to not drag the gun through the dirt or foul the ejection port any more than necessary. So we're trying to do this by snagging that rear sight and going up and out. So we can leverage it in front of us like that. Or we can flip the gun over, reverse grip it like this, dig the rear sight in, put the body weight on top of it, and cycle it that way. You're gonna notice this is not a good way. Uh, I don't prefer this, I prefer the extension method. It's a lot easier to me. This one's a little too awkward, though you can do it. The choice is up to you. 